The Door into Infinity by Edmund Hamilton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. An amazing, weird mystery story packed with thrills, danger, and startling events. The Door into Infinity by Edmund Hamilton. Contents 1. The Brotherhood of the Door. 2. Death Trap. 3. Up the Water Tunnel. 4. The Caverns of the Door. 5. The Door Opens. 1. The Brotherhood of the Door. Where leads the door? It leads outside our world. Who taught our forefathers to open the door? They beyond the door taught them. To whom do we bring these sacrifices? We bring them to those beyond the door. Shall the door be opened that they may take them? Let the door be opened. Paul Innes had listened thus far, his haggard face uncomprehending in expression. But now he interrupted the speaker. But what does it all mean, Inspector? Why are you repeating this to me? Did you ever hear anyone speak words like that? asked Inspector Pierce Campbell, leaning tautly forward for the answer. Of course not. It just sounds like gibberish to me, Annis exclaimed. What connection can that have with my wife? He had risen to his feet, a tall, blond young American, whose good-looking face was drawn and worn by inward agony, whose crisp yellow hair was brushed back from his forehead in disorder, and whose blue eyes were haunted with an anguished dread. He kicked back his chair and strode across the gloomy little office, whose single window looked out on the thickening, foggy twilight of London. He bent across the dingy desk, gripping its edges with his hands as he spoke tensely to the man sitting behind it. "'Why are we wasting time talking here?' Innes cried. "'Sitting there, talking, when anything could be happening to Ruth. It's been hours since she was kidnapped. They may have taken her anywhere, even outside London by now. And instead of searching for her, you sit there and talk gibberish about doors. Inspector Campbell seemed unmoved by Ennis' passion. A bulky, almost bald man, he looked up with his colorless, sagging face, in which his eyes gleamed like two crumbs of bright brown glass. You're not helping me much by giving way to your emotions, Mr. Ennis, he said in his flat voice. Give way? Who wouldn't give way? cried Ennis. Don't you understand, man? It's Ruth that's gone. My wife. Why, we were married only last week in New York, and on our second day here in London I see her whisk into a limousine and carried away before my eyes. I thought you men at Scotland Yard here would surely act, do something. Instead you talk crazy gibberish to me. Those words are not gibberish, said Pierce Campbell quietly and I think they're related to the abduction of your wife. What do you mean? How could they be related? The inspector's bright little brown eyes held Ennis. Did you ever hear of an organization called the Brotherhood of the Door? Ennis shook his head, and Campbell continued. Well, I am certain that your wife is kidnapped by members of the Brotherhood. What kind of organization is it? the young American demanded. A band of criminals? No, it is no ordinary criminal organization, the detective said, his sagging face set strangely. Unless I am mistaken, the Brotherhood of the Door is the most unholy and blackly evil organization that has ever existed on this earth. Almost nothing is known of it outside its circle. I myself, in twenty years, have learned little except of its existence and name. That ritual I just repeated to you? I heard from the lips of a dying member of the Brotherhood, who repeated the words in his delirium. Campbell leaned forward. But I know that every year, about this time, the Brotherhood come from all over the world and gather at some secret center here in England. And every year, before the gathering, scores of people are kidnapped and never heard of again. I believe that all those people were kidnapped by this mysterious Brotherhood. 
But what becomes of the people they kidnap? cried the pale young American. What do they do with them? Inspector Campbell's bright brown eyes showed a hint of hooded horror, yet he shook his head. I know no more than you, but whatever they do to the victims, they are never heard of again. But you must know something more, Ennis protested. What is this door? Campbell again shook his head. That, too, I don't know, but whatever it is, the door is utterly sacred to the members of the Brotherhood, and whomever they mean by they beyond the door, they dread and venerate to the utmost. Where leads the door? It leads outside our world, repeated Ennis. What can that mean? It might have a symbolic meaning, referring to some secluded fastness of the order which is away from the rest of the world, the inspector said. Or it might. He stopped. Or it might what? Annis pressed, his pale face thrust forward. It might mean literally that the door leads outside our world and universe, finished the inspector. Innes' haunted eyes stared. You mean that this door might somehow lead to another universe? But that's impossible. Perhaps unlikely, Campbell said quietly, but not impossible. Modern science has taught us that there are other universes than the one we live in, universes congruent and coincident with our own in space and time, yet separated from our own by an impassable barrier of totally different dimensions. It is not entirely impossible that a greater science than ours might find a way to pierce that barrier between our universe and one of those outside ones, that a door should be opened from ours into one of the others in the infinite outside. A door into the infinite outside, repeated Annis, broodingly, looking past the inspector. Then he made a sudden movement of wild impatience, the dread leaping back strong in his eyes again. Oh, what good is all this talk of doors and infinite universes doing in finding Ruth? I want to do something. If you think this mysterious brotherhood has taken her, you must surely have some idea how we can get her back from them. You must know something more about them than you've told. I don't know anything more, certainly, but I have certain suspicions that amount to convictions, Inspector Campbell said. I've been working on this brotherhood for many years, and block after block I've narrowed down to the place I think the Order's local center, the London headquarters of the Brotherhood of the Door. Where is this place? asked Ennis tensely. It is in the waterfront cafe of one Chandra Das, a Hindu, back by the East India docks, said the detective officer. I've been in there in disguise more than once, watching the place. This Chandra Das i found to be immensely feared by everyone in the quarter, which strengthens my belief that he is one of the high officers of the Brotherhood. He's too exceptional a man to be really running such a place. Then if the Brotherhood took Ruth, she may be there right now, cried the young American, electrified. Campbell nodded his bald head. She may very likely be. Tonight I'm going there again in disguise, and have men ready to raid the place. If Chandra Das has your wife there, we'll get her before he can get her away. Whatever way it turns out, we'll let you know at once. Like hell you will, exploded the pale young Ennis. Do you think I'm going to twiddle my thumbs while you're down there? I'm going with you. And if you refuse to let me, by heaven, I'll go there by myself. Inspector Pierce Campbell gave the haggard, fiercely determined face of the young man a long look. Then his own colorless countenance seemed to soften a little. All right, he said quietly. I can disguise you so you'll not be recognized. But you'll have to follow my orders exactly or death will result for both of us. That strange, hooded dread flickered again in his eyes, as though he saw, through shrouding mists, the outline of a dim horror. It may be, he added slowly, that something worse than death awaits those who try to oppose the Brotherhood of the Door, something that would explain the unearthly, superhuman dread that enwraps the secret mysteries of the Order. We're taking more than our lives in our hands, I think, in trying to unveil those mysteries, to regain your wife, 
but we've got to act quickly at all costs we've got to find her before the great gathering of the brotherhood takes place or we'll never find her two hours before midnight found campbell and innes passing along the cobble paved waterfront street north of the great east india docks big warehouses towered black and silent in the darkness on one side and on the other were old rotting docks beyond which innes glimpsed the black water and gliding lights of the river as they straggled beneath the infrequent lights on the ill-lit street they were utterly changed in appearance inspector campbell dressed in a shabby suit and rusty bowler his dirty white shirt innocent of tie had acquired a new face a bright red oily eager one with a high squeaky voice innes wore a rough blue seaman's jacket and a visored cap pulled down over his head his unshaven-looking face and subtly altered features made him seem a half-intoxicated seaman off his ship as he stumbled unsteadily along. Campbell clung to him in a true land-shark fashion, plucking his arm and talking wheedlingly to him. They came on to the more populous section of the evil old waterfront street and passed fried fish shops giving off the strong smell of hot fat and the dirty lighted windows of a half-dozen waterfront saloons loud with sordid arguments or merriment campbell led past them until they reached one built upon an abandoned mouldering pier a ramshackle frame structure extending some distance back out on the pier its window was curtained and a dull red light glowed through the glass window of the door a few shabby men were lounging in front of the place but campbell paid them no attention tugging in us inside by the arm come on in he wheedled shrilly the night ain't half over yet we'll have just one more don't want any more muttered innes drunkenly swaying on his feet inside get away you damned old shark yet he suffered himself to be led by campbell to a table where he slumped heavily into a chair his stare swung vacantly the cafe of chandra das was a red-lit smoke-filled cave with cheap black curtains on the walls and windows and other curtains cutting off the back part of the building from view the dim room was jammed with tables crowded with patrons whose babble of tongues made an unceasing din to which a three-string guitar somewhere added a wailing undertone the waiters were dark-skinned and tiger-footed malays while the patrons seemed drawn from every nation east and west in his gazing eyes saw dandified chinese from limehouse and pennysfield dark little levantons from soho rough-looking cockneys in shabby caps and a few crazy laughing blacks from sly white faces taut brown ones and impassive yellow ones came a dozen different languages the air was thick with queer food smells and acrid smoke campbell had selected a table near the back curtain and now stridently ordered one of the malay waiters to bring gin he leaned forward with an oily smile to the drunken-looking innes and spoke to him in a wheedling undertone don't look for a minute but that's chandra das over in the corner and he's watching us he said innes shook his clutched hand away damn old shark he muttered again he turned his swaying head slowly letting his eyes rest a moment on the man in the corner the man was looking straight at him. Chandra Das was tall, dressed in spotless white from his toes to the turban on his head. The white made his dark, impassive, aquiline face stand out in chiseled relief. His eyes were coal-black, large, coldly searching, as they met Innes's bleary gaze. Innes felt a strange chill as he met those eyes. There was something alien and inhuman, something uncannily disturbing behind the Hindu's stare. He turned his gaze vacantly from Chandra Das back to the black curtains at the rear, and then back to his companion. A silent Malay waiter had brought the liquor, and Campbell pressed a glass toward his companion. Here, matey, take this. Don't want it, muttered Innes, pushing it away. Still, in the same mutter, he added, If Ruth's here, she's somewhere in back there. I'm going back and find out don't try it that way for god's sake said campbell with a wheedling undertone chandra das is still watching and those malays would be on you in a minute wait until i give the word 
All right, then, Campbell added in a louder, injured tone. If you don't want it, I'll drink it myself. He tossed off the glass of gin and set the glass down on the table, looking at his drunken companion with righteous indignation. Think I'm trying to bilk you, eh? he added. That's a fine way to treat a pal. He added in a coaxing, lower tone, All right, I'm going to try it. Be ready to move when I light my cigarette. He fished a soiled packet of gold flakes from his pocket and put one in his mouth. Ennis waited, every muscle taut. The inspector, his red, oily face still injured in expression, struck a match to his cigarette. Almost at once there was a loud oath from one of the shabby loungers outside the front of the building, and the sound of angry voices and blows. The patrons of Chandra Das looked toward the door. One of the melee waiters went hastily out to quiet the fight, but it grew swiftly, sounded in a moment like a small riot. Crash! Someone was pushed through the front window. The excited patrons pressed toward the front. Chandra Das pushed through them, issuing quick orders to his servants. For the time being, the back of the café was deserted and unnoticed. Campbell sprang to his feet, and with Innes close behind him, darted through the black curtains. They found themselves in a black corridor, at the end of which a red bulb burned dimly. They could still hear the uproar. Campbell's gun was in his hand, and the Americans in his. We dare only stay a few moments, the inspector cried. Look in those rooms along the corridor here. Innes frantically tore open the door and peered into the dark room smelling of drugs. Ruth, he cried softly. Ruth! 2. Death Trap There was no answer. The light in the corridor behind him suddenly went out, plunging him into pitch-black darkness. He jumped back into the dark corridor, and as he did so, heard a sudden scuffle further along it. Campbell, he exclaimed plunging forward into the black passage. There was no answer. He pitched forward through the Stygian obscurity, his hands searching ahead of him for the inspector. In the dark something whipped smoothly around his throat, tightening there like a slender, contracting tentacle. Ennis tore frenziedly at the thing, which he felt to be a slender silken cord, but he could not loosen it. It was choking him. He tried to cry out again to Campbell, but his throat, could not emit the sounds. He thrashed, twisted helplessly, hearing a loud roaring in his ears, consciousness receding. Then, dimly, as though in a dream, Annis was aware of being lowered to the floor, of being half carried and half dragged along. The constriction around his throat was gone, and rapidly his brain began to clear. He opened his eyes. He found himself lying on the floor of a room illuminated by a great hanging brass lamp of ornate design. The walls of the room were hung with rich, grotesquely worked red silk Indian draperies. His hands and feet were bound behind him, and beside him, tied in the same manner, lay Inspector Campbell. Over them stood Chandra Das and two of the Malay servants. The faces of the servants were tigerish in their menace but Chandra Das's face was one of dark, impassive scorn. So you misguided fools thought you could deceive me so easily as that, he said in a strong, vibrant voice. Why, we knew hours ago that you, Inspector Campbell, and you, Mr. Ennis, were coming here tonight. We let you get this far, only because it was evident that somehow you had learned too much about us and that it would be best to let you come here and meet your deaths. Chandra Das, I've men outside, rasped Campbell. If we don't come out, they'll come in after us. The Hindu's proud, dark face did not change its scorn. They will not come in for a little while, Inspector. By that time you two will be dead, and we shall be gone with our captives. Yes, Mr. Innes, your wife is one of those captives he added to the prostrate young American. It is too bad we cannot take you and the inspector to share her glorious destiny. But then our accommodations of transport are limited. Ruth, here? In his face flamed at the words. He raised himself a little from the floor on his elbows. Then you'll let her go if I pay you? I'll raise any amount. I'll do anything you ask if you set her free. 
No amount of money in the world could buy her from the Brotherhood of the Door, answered Chandra Das steadily. For she belongs now not to us, but to they beyond the door. Within a few hours she and the others will stand before the door, and they beyond the door will take them. What are you doing to her? cried Ennis. What is the damn door, and who are they beyond it? I do not think that even if I told you, your little mind would be able to accept the mighty truth, Chandra Das said calmly. His coal-black eyes suddenly flashed with frantic, frenetic light. How could your poor, earth-bound little intelligences conceive the true nature of the door, and of those who dwell beyond it? your puny brains would be stricken senseless by the mere apprehension of them. They, who are mighty and crafty and dreadful beyond anything on earth. A cold wind from an alien unknown seemed to sweep the lamp-lit room with the Hindu's passionate words. Then that rapt, frantic exhalation dropped from him as suddenly as it had come, and he spoke in his ordinary vibrant tones. But enough of this parley with blind worms of the dust. Bring the weights. The last words were addressed to the Malay servant, who sprang to a closet in the corner of the room. Inspector Campbell said steadily, If my men find us dead, when they come in here, they'll leave none of you living. Chandra Das did not even listen to him, but ordered the dark servant sharply, Attach the weights. The Malays had brought from the closet two fifty-pound lead balls, and they now proceeded quickly to tie these to the feet of the two men. Then one of them rolled back a brilliant red Indian rug from the rough pine floor. A square trap-door was disclosed, and at Chandra Das' orders it was swung upward and open. Up through the open square came the sound of waves slap-slapping against the piles of the old pier, and the heavy odor of salt water and of rotting wood invaded the room. The water under this pier is twenty feet deep, Chandra Das told the two prisoners. I regret to give you so easy a death, but there is no opportunity to take you to the fate you deserve. Ennis, his skin crawling on his flesh, nevertheless spoke rapidly, and as steadily as possible to the Hindu. Listen, I don't ask you to let me go, but I'll do anything you want. Let you kill me any way you want, if you'll let Ruth. Sheer horror cut short his words. The Malay servants had dragged Campbell's bound body to the door in the floor. They shoved him over the edge. Ennis had one glimpse of the inspector's taut, strange face falling out of sight. Then a dull splash sounded instantly below, and then silence. He felt hands upon him, dragging him across the floor. He fought, crazily, hopelessly, twisting his body in its bounds, thrashing his bound limbs wildly. He saw the dark, unmoved face of Chandra Das, the brass lamp over his head, the red hangings. Then his head dangled over the opening. A shove sent his body scraping through the edge, and he plunged downward through the dank darkness. With a splash he hit the icy water and went under. A heavy weight at his ankles dragged him irresistibly downward. Instinctively he held his breath as the water rushed upward around him. His feet struck oozy bottom. His body swayed there, chained by the lead weight to the bottom. His lungs were already bursting to draw air. Slow fires seemed to creep through his breast as he held his breath. Innes knew that in a moment or two he would inhale the strangling waters and die. The thought-picture of Ruth flashed across his despairing mind, wild with hopeless regret. He could no longer hold his breath. He felt his muscles relax against his will, tasting the stinging salt water at the back of his nose. Then it was a bursting confusion of swift sensations, the choking water in his nose and throat, the roaring in his ears. A scroll of flame unrolled slowly in his brain, and a voice shouted there, You're dying! He felt dimly a plucking at his ankles. Abruptly, Innes' dim mind was aware that he was now shooting upward through the water. His head burst into the open air, and he choked, strangled, and gasped, his tortured lungs gulping the damp, heavy air. He opened his eyes and shook the water from them. 
He was floating in the darkness at the surface of the water. Someone was floating beside him, supporting him. Innes' chin bumped the other's shoulder, and he heard a familiar voice. "'Easy now,' said Inspector Campbell. "'Wait until I cut your hands loose.' "'Campbell!' Innes choked. "'How did you get loose?' "'Never mind that now,' the inspector answered. "'Don't make any noise, or they may hear us up there.' Innes felt a knife-blade slashing the bonds at his wrists. Then, the inspector's arm helping him, he and his companion paddled weakly through the darkness under the rotting pier. They bumped against the slimy, moldering piles, threaded through them toward the side of the pier. The waves of the flooding tide washed them up and down as Campbell led the way. They passed out from under the old pier into the comparative illumination of the stars. Looking back up, Ennis saw the long, black mass of the house of Chandra Das resting on the black pier, ruddy light glowing from the window cracks. He collided with something and found that Campbell had led toward a small floating dock where some skiffs were moored. They scrambled up onto it from the water and lay panting for a few moments. Campbell had something in his hand, a thin, razor-edged steel blade several inches long. Its hilt was an ordinary leather shoe heel. The inspector turned up one of his feet, and Innes saw that the heel was missing from that shoe. Carefully, Campbell slid the steel blade beneath the shoe's sole, and the heel hilt slid into place, and seeming merely to be an innocent heel of the shoe. "'So that's how you got loose down in the water!' Innes exclaimed, and the inspector nodded briefly. "'That trick's done me a good service before.' Even with your hands tied behind your back, you can get out that knife and use it. It was touch and go, though, whether I could get it out and cut myself loose in the water in time enough to free you. Innes gripped the inspector's shoulder. Campbell, Ruth is in there. By heavens, we've found her, and now we can get her out. Right, said the officer grimly. We'll go around to the front, and in two minutes we'll be in there with my men. They climbed, dripping to their feet, and hastened from the little floating dock up onto the shore, through the darkness to the cobbled street. The shabbily disguised men of Inspector Campbell were not now in front of Chandra Das' café, but lurking in the shadows across the street. They came running toward Campbell and Innes. "'All right, we're going in there,' Campbell exclaimed in steely tones. "'Get Chandra Das, whatever you do.' but see that his prisoners are not harmed. He snapped a word, and one of the men handed pistols to him and to Innes. Then they leapt toward the door of the Hindu's café, from which still streamed ruddy light and the babble of many voices. A kick from Inspector Campbell sent the door flying inward, and they burst in with guns gleaming wickedly in the ruddy light. Innes's face was a quivering mask of desperate resolve. The motley patron jumped up with yells of alarm at their entrance. The hand of a melee waiter jerked, and a throwing knife thudded into the wall beside them. Innes yelled as he saw Chandra Das, his dark face startled, leaping back with his servants through the black curtains. He and Campbell drove through the squealing patrons toward the back. The melee who had thrown the knife rushed to bar the way, another dagger uplifted. Campbell's gun coughed, and the melee reeled and stumbled. The inspector and Innes threw themselves at the black curtains, but were dashed back. They tore aside the black folds. A dull steel door had been lowered behind them, barring the way to the back rooms. Innes beat crazily upon it with his pistol butt, but it remained immovable. "'No use. We can't break it down,' yelled Campbell over the uproar. "'Outside and around the other end of the building.' They burst back out through that madhouse, into the dark of the street. They started along the side of the pier toward the river end, edging forward on a narrow ledge but inches wide. As they reached the back of the building, Innes shouted and pointed to dark figures at the end of the pier. There were two of them, lowering shapeless, wrapped forms over the end of the pier. "'There they are!' he cried. "'They've got their prisoners out there with them!' Campbell's pistol leveled but Innes swiftly struck it up. No, you might hit Ruth. He and the inspector bounded forward along the pier. Fire streaked from the dark ahead, and bullets thumped in the rotten boards around them. 
Suddenly, the loud roar of an accelerated motor drowned out all other sounds. It came from the river at the pier's end. Campbell and Innes reached the end in time to see a long, powerful, gray motorboat dash out into the black obscurity of the river and roar eastward with gathering speed. "'There they go! They're getting away!' cried the agonized young American. Campbell cupped his hands and shouted out into the darkness. "'River police! Ahoy! Ahoy there!' He rasped to Ennis. The river police were to have a cutter here tonight. We can still catch them. With swiftly rising roar of speeded motors, a big cutter drove in from the darkness. Its searchlight snapped on, bathing the two men on the pier in a blinding glare. Ahoy there, cried a stentorian voice over the roar of the motors. Is that Inspector Campbell? Yes, come alongside, yelled the inspector as the big cutter shot close to the end of the pier, its reversing propellers turning the dark water to foam, Ennis and Campbell leaped. They landed amid unseen men in the cockpit, and as he scrambled to his feet, the inspector cried, Follow that boat that just went down river, but no shooting. With thunderous drumfire from its exhaust, the cutter jerked forward so rapidly that it almost threw them from their feet again. It shot out into the bosom of the dark river that flowed like a black sea between the banks of the scattered lights that were London. The moving lights of yachts and barges coming up river could be seen gliding in the darkness. The captain of the cutter barked an order, and one of his three men, the one crouched at the searchlight, switched its powerful beam out over the water ahead. In a moment it picked up a distant gray spot racing eastward on the black river leaving a white trail of foam there she is bawled the man at the searchlight she's running without lights keep her in the searchlight ordered the captain sound our siren and give the cutter her head swaying rocking the cutter roared on through the darkness on the trail of the distant fleeing speck as they raced down black wall reach the distance between the two craft had already begun to lessen we're overtaking him cried campbell clutching at a stanchion and peering ahead against the rush of wind and spray he must be making for whatever spot it is in england that is the centre of the brotherhood of the door but he'll never reach it he said that within a few hours ruth would go with the others through the door cried ennis clinging behind him campbell we mustn't let them get away now pursuer and pursued flashed down the dark broadening river through the maze of shipping the cutter hanging doggedly to the motorboat's trail. The lights of London had dropped behind those of Tilbury, now gleaming ahead on their left. Bigger, stronger waves now tossed and pounded the cutter as it raced out of the river mouth toward the heaving black expanse of the sea. The Kent coast was a black blur on their right. The grey motorboat followed it closely, grazing almost beneath the Sheerness lights. He's heading to round North Foreland and follow the coast south to Ramsgate or Dover, the cutter captain cried to Campbell. But we'll catch him before he passes Margate. The quarry was now a quarter mile ahead. Steadily, as they roared onward, the gap narrowed, until in the glare of the searchlight they could make out every detail of the powerful grey motorboat plunging through the tossing black waves. They saw Chandra Das' dark face turn and look at them and the cutter captain raised his speaking trumpet to his lips and shouted over the roar of motors and the dash of waves stand by or we'll fire at you he won't obey muttered campbell between his teeth he knows we don't dare fire with the girl in the boat yes blast him exclaimed the captain but we'll have him in a few minutes anyway the thundering chase had brought them into sight of the lights of margate on the dark coast to their right now only a few hundred feet of black water separated them from the fleeing craft. Innes and the inspector gripped the stanchions of the rushing cutter, saw a white figure suddenly stand erect in the boat ahead, waving its arms to them. The grey motorboat slowed. It's Chandra Das, and he's signaling that he's giving up, Innes cried. He's stopping. By heaven he is, Campbell exclaimed. Drive alongside him, and we'll soon have the irons on him. The cutter, its own motors hastily throttled down, shot through the water toward the slowing gray craft. Innes saw Chandra Das standing erect, awaiting their coming, he and two Malays beside him holding their hands in the air. He saw a half-dozen or more white-wrapped forms in the bottom of the boat, 
lying motionless. There are their prisoners, he cried. Bring the boat closer so we can jump in. He and Campbell, their pistols out, hunched to jump as the cutter drove close to the gray motorboat. The sides of the two craft bumped, the motors of both idling noisily. Then, before Ennis and Campbell could jump into the motorboat, things happened with cinema-like rapidity. Two of the still white forms at the bottom of the motorboat leapt up and, like suddenly uncoiled springs, shot through the air into the cutter. They were two other melees, their dark faces flaming with frantic light, keen daggers glinting in their upraised hands. We're a trick, yelled Campbell, his gun barking, but the bullets missed and the dagger slit his sleeve. The melees, with wild screeching yells, were laying about them with their daggers in the cutter, insanely. God in heaven, they've run amuck, choked the cutter captain. His slashed neck spurted blood, and his face livid. He fell. One of his men slumped, coughing beside him. Another victim of the crazy daggers. 3. Up the Water Tunnel The man at the searchlight sprang for the maddened melees, tugging at his pistol as he jumped. Before he got the weapon out, a dagger slashed his jugular, and he went down gurgling in death. One of the melees, meanwhile, had knocked Inspector Campbell from his feet, his knife hand swooping down, his eyes blazing. Ennis' gun roared, and the bullet hit the melee between the eyes. But as he slumped limply, the other fanatic was upon Ennis from the side. Before Ennis could whirl to meet him, the attacker's knife grazed down past his cheek like a brand of living fire. He was borne backward by the rush, felt the hot breath of the crazed melee in his face the dagger point at his throat. Shots roared quickly, one after another, and with each shot the melee pressed Ennis back, jerked convulsively. With the light of murderous madness fading from his eyes, he still strove to drive the dagger home into the American's throat. But a hand jerked him back, and he lay prostrate and still. Ennis scrambled up to find Inspector Campbell, pale and determined, over him. The detective had shot the attacker from behind. The captain of the cutter and two of his men lay dead in the cockpit beside the two melees. The remaining seaman, the helmsman, held his shoulder and groaned. Annis whirled. The motorboat of Chandra Das was no longer beside the cutter, and there was no sight of it anywhere on the Black Sea ahead. The Hindu had taken advantage of the fight to make good his escape, with his two other servants and their prisoners. "'Campbell, he's gone!' cried the young American frantically. "'He got away!' The inspector's eyes were bright with the cold flame of anger. Yes, Chandra Dost sacrificed these two melees to hold us up long enough for him to escape. Campbell whirled to the helmsman. You're not badly hurt? Only a scratch, but I nearly broke my shoulder when I fell, answered the man. Then head on around North Foreland, Campbell cried. We may still be able to catch up with them. But Captain Wilson and the others are killed, protested the helmsman. I've got to report. You can report later, rasped the inspector. Do as I say. I'll be responsible. Very well, sir, said the helmsman, and jumped back to the wheel. In a minute the big cutter was roaring ahead over the heaving black waves, its searchlight clawing the darkness ahead. There was no sign now of the craft of Chandra Das ahead. They raced abreast of the lights of Margate, started rounding the North Foreland, pounded by bigger seas. Inspector Campbell had dragged the bodies of the dead policemen and their two slayers down into the cabin of the cutter. He came up and crouched down with Innes beside Stuart, the helmsman. "'I found these on the two melees,' Campbell shouted to the American, holding out two little objects in his spray-wet hands. Each was a flat star of grey metal, in which was set a large, oval, cabochon-cut jewel. The jewels flashed and dazzled with deep colour but it was a color wholly unfamiliar and alien to their eyes. "'These are not any color we know on earth,' Campbell shouted. "'I believe these jewels came from somewhere beyond the door, and that these are badges of the Brotherhood of the Door.' Stuart, the helmsman, leaned toward the inspector. "'We've rounded North Foreland, sir,' he cried. "'Ahead straight, south along the coast,' Campbell ordered. "'Chandra Das must have gone this way.' No doubt he thinks he's shaken us off, and is making for the gathering place of the Brotherhood, wherever that may be. 
The cutter isn't built for seas like this, Stuart said, shaking his head. But I'll do it. They were now following the coast southward, the lights of Ramsgate dropping back on their right. The waters out here in the channel were wider, great black waves tossing the cutter to the sky one moment, and then dropping it sickeningly the next. Frequently its screws raced loudly as they encountered no resistance but air. Ennis, clinging precariously on the foredeck, turned the searchlight's stabbing white beam back and forth on the heaving dark sea ahead, but without any sign of their quarry disclosed. White foam of breaking waves began to show around them like bared teeth, and there was a humming in the air. "'Storm's coming up the channel!' Stuart exclaimed. "'It'll do for us if it catches us out here.' "'We've got to keep on,' Ennis told him desperately. "'We must come up with him soon.' The coast on their right was now one of black, rocky cliffs towering all along the shore in a jagged, frowning wall, against which the waves dashed foamy white. The cutter crept southward over the wild waters, tossed like a chip upon the great waves. Stuart was having a hard time holding the craft out from the rocks, and now its prow pointed obliquely away from them. The humming in the air changed to a shrill whistling as the outrider winds of the storm came upon them. The cutter tossed still more wildly, and black masses of water smashed in upon them from the darkness, dazing and drenching them. Suddenly Ennis yelled, "'There's a lights of a boat ahead! There, moving in toward the cliffs!' He pointed ahead, and Campbell and the helmsman peered through the blinding spray and darkness. A pair of low lights were moving at high speed on the water there, straight towards the towering black cliffs. Then they vanished suddenly from sight. There must be a hidden opening or harbor of some kind in the cliffs, Inspector Campbell exclaimed. But that can't be Chandra Dass' boat, for it carried no lights. It might be the others of the Brotherhood going to the meeting place, Ennis exclaimed. We can follow and see. Stuart thrust his head through the flying spray and shouted, There are openings and water caverns aplenty in those cliffs, but there's nothing in any of them. We'll find out, Campbell said. Head straight toward the cliffs in there where the boat vanished. If we can't find the opening, we'll be smashed to flinders on those cliffs, Stuart warned. I'm gambling that we'll find the opening, Campbell told him. Go ahead. Stuart's face was set stolidly, and he said, Yes, sir. He turned the prow of the cutter toward the cliffs. Instantly they dashed forward toward the rock walls with greatly increased speed wild waves bearing them onward like charging stallions of the sea hunched beside the helmsman the searchlight stabbed the dark wildly as the cutter was flung forward by the waves ennis and the inspector watched as the cliffs loomed closer ahead the brilliant white beam struck across the rushing mountainous waves and showed only the towering barrier of the rock battered and smitten by the ravening waters that frothed white they could hear the booming thunder of the raging ocean striking the rock like a projectile hurled by a giant hand, the cutter fairly flew now toward the cliffs. They now could see even the little streams that ran off the rough rock wall as each giant wave broke against it. They were almost upon it. Stuart's face was deadly. I can't see any opening, he yelled, and we're going to hit in a moment. To your left, screamed Campbell over the booming thunder. There's an arched opening there. Now Innes saw it also, a huge arch-shaped opening in the cliff that had been concealed by an angle of the wall. Stuart tried frantically to head the cutter toward it, but the wheel was useless as the great waves bore the craft along. Innes saw that they would strike a little to the side of the opening. The cliff loomed ahead, and he closed his eyes to the impact. There was no impact, and as he heard a hoarse cry from Inspector Campbell, he opened his eyes. The cutter was flying in through a mighty opening, snatched into it by the powerful currents. They were whirled irresistibly forward under a huge rock arch, which loomed forty feet over their heads. Before them stretched a winding water tunnel inside the cliff, and now they were out of the wild uproar of the storm waters outside, and in an almost stupefying silence. Smoothly, resistlessly, the current bore them on in the tunnel whose winding turns ahead were lit up by their searchlight. "'God, that was close!' exclaimed Inspector Campbell. 
His eyes flashed. Innes, I believe that we have found the gathering place of the Brotherhood. That boat we sighted is somewhere ahead in here, and so must be Chandra Das, and your wife. Innes' hand tightened on his gun butt. If that's so, if we can just find them. Blind action won't help if we do, said the inspector swiftly. There must be all the number of the Brotherhood's members assembled here, and we can't fight them all. His eyes suddenly lit, and he took the blazing jewel stars from his pocket. These badges. With them we can pose as members of the Brotherhood, perhaps long enough to find your wife. But Chandra Das will be there, and if he sees us... Campbell shrugged. We'll have to take that chance. It's the only course open to us. The current of the inflowing tide was still bearing them smoothly onward toward the winding water tunnel, around bends and angles where they scraped the rock, down long straight stretches. Stuart used the motors to guide them around the turns. Meanwhile, Inspector Campbell and Ennis quickly ripped from the cutter its police insignia and covered all evidence of it being a police craft. Stuart suddenly snicked off the searchlight. Light ahead there, he exclaimed. Around the next turn of the water tunnel showed a gleam of strange, soft light. Careful now, cautioned the inspector. Stuart, whatever we do, you stay in the cutter and try to have it ready for a quick getaway if we leave it. Stuart nodded silently. The helmsman's stolid face had become a little pale, but he showed no sign of losing his courage. The cutter sped around the next turn of the tunnel and emerged into a huge, softly lit cavern. Stuart's eyes bulged, and Campbell uttered an exclamation of amazement. For in this mighty water cavern there floated, in a great mass, scores of seagoing craft, large and small. All of them were capable of breasting storm and wind, and some were so large they could barely have entered. There were small yachts, big motor cruisers, seagoing launches, cutters larger than their own, and among them the grey motor launch of Chandra Das. They were massed together here, those with masts having lowered them to enter, floating and rubbing sides, quite unoccupied. Around the edges of the water cavern ran a wild rock ledge but no living person was visible, and there was no visible source for the soft, strange white light that filled the astounding place. These craft must have come here from all over the earth, Campbell muttered. The Brotherhood of the Door has assembled here. We've found their gathering place all right. But where are they? exclaimed Ennis. I don't see anyone. We'll soon find out, the inspector said. Stuart, run close to the edge there, and we'll get out on it. Stuart obeyed, and as the cutter bumped the ledge, Campbell and Ennis leaped out onto it. They looked this way and that along it, but no one was in sight. The weirdness of it was unnerving, the strangely lit mighty cavern, the assembled boats, the utter silence. "'Follow me,' Campbell said in a low voice. "'They must all be somewhere near.' He and Ennis walked a few steps along the ledge. Then the American stopped. "'Campbell, listen,' he whispered. Dimly there whispered to them, as though from a distance and through great walls, a swelling sound of chanting. As they listened, hearts beating rapidly, a square of the rock wall of the cavern abruptly flew open beside them, as though hinged like a door. Inside it was the mouth of a soft-lit, man-high tunnel, and in its opening stood two men. They wore over their clothing, shroud-like, loose-hanging robes of grey asbestos-like material. They wore hoods of the same grey stuff over their heads, pierced with slits at the eyes and mouth, and each wore on his breast the blazing star badge. Through the eye slits the eyes of the two surveyed Campbell and Innes as they halted, transfixed by the sudden apparition. Then one of the hooded men spoke measuredly in a hissing Mongolian voice. "'Are you who come here of the Brotherhood of the Door?' he asked, apparently repeating a customary challenge. Campbell answered, his flat voice tremorless, We are of the Brotherhood. Why do you not wear the badges of the Brotherhood, then? For answer, the inspector reached in his pocket for the strange emblem and fastened it to his lapel. Ennis did the same. Enter, brothers, said the hissing hooded shape, standing aside to let them pass. 
as they stepped into the tunnel the hooded guard added in slightly more natural tones brothers you two are late you must hurry to get your protective robes for the ceremony soon begins campbell inclined his head without speaking and he and ennis started along the tunnel its light as sourceless as the great water cavern revealed that it was chiseled from solid rock and that it wound downward when they were out of sight of the two hooded guards ennis clutched the detective's arm convulsively campbell he said the ceremony begins soon we've got to find ruth first we'll try the inspector answered swiftly these hooded robes are apparently issued to all the members to be worn during the ceremony as protection for some reason and once we get robes and get them on chandra das won't be able to spot us look out he added an instant later here's the place where the robes are issued the tunnel had debauched suddenly into a wider space in which were a group of men several were wearing the concealing hoods and robes and one of these hooded figures was handing out from a large rack of robes three of the garments to three dark easterners who had apparently entered in the boat just ahead of the cutter the three dark orientals their faces gleaming with a strange fanaticism quickly donned the robes and hoods and passed hurriedly on down the tunnel at once campbell and ennis stepped calmly up to the hooded custodians of the robes and extended their hands one of the hooded figures took down two robes and handed them to them but suddenly one of the other hooded men spoke sharply instantly all the hooded men but the one who had spoken with loud cries threw themselves forward on campbell and paul ennis taken utterly by surprise the two had no chance to draw their guns they were smothered by gray-robed men held helplessly before they could move a half dozen pistols jammed into their bodies stupefied by the sudden dashing of their hopes the detective and the young american saw the hooded man who had spoken slowly lift the concealing gray cowl from his face it was the dark cold contemptuous face of chandra das five the door opens where leads the door rolled the chief priest's voice back up to him came the reply of hundreds of voices muffled by the hood but loud echoing to the roof of the cavern in a thunderous response it leads outside our world the chief priest waited until the echoes died before his deep voice rolled on in the ritual who taught our forefathers to open the door ennis edging desperately closer and closer to the line of victims felt a mighty response reverberate around him they beyond the door taught them now ennis was apart from the other priests on the dais within a few yards of the captives of the small figure of ruth to whom do we bring these sacrifices as the high priest uttered the words and before the booming answer came a hand grasped ennis and pulled him back from the line of victims he spun around to find that it was one of the other priests who had jerked him back we bring them to those beyond the door as the colossal response thundered the priest who had jerked ennis back whispered urgently to him you go too close to the victims chandra das do you wish to be taken with them the fellow had a tight grip on ennis arm desperate tensed ennis heard the chief priest roll forth the last of the ritual shall the door be opened that they may take their sacrifices stunning mighty a tremendous shout that mingled in it worshipping awe and superhuman dread the answer crashed back let the door be open the chief priest turned and his upflung arms whirled in a signal ennis tensing to spring toward ruth saw the two priests at the gray mechanism swiftly turn the knurled black knobs then ennis like all else in the vast cavern was held frozen and spellbound by what followed the spherical web of wires pulsed up madly with shining force and up at the center of the gleaming black oval facets on the wall there appeared a spark of unearthly green light it blossomed outward expanded an awful vividescent flower blooming quickly outward further and further and as it expanded ennis saw that he could look through the green light he looked through into another universe 
a universe lying infinitely far across alien dimensions from our own, yet one that could be reached through this door between dimensions. It was a green universe, flooded with an awful green light that was somehow more akin to darkness than to light, a throbbing, baleful luminescence. Innes saw dimly through the green-lit spaces a city in the near distance, an unholy city of emerald hue, whose unsymmetrical, twisted towers and minarets aspired into heavens of hellish vivitry. The towers of that city swayed to and fro and writhed in the air, and Innes saw that here and there, in the soft green substance of that restless city, were circles of lurid light that were like yellow eyes. In ghastly, soul-shaking apprehension of the utterly alien, Innes knew that the yellow circles were eyes, and that the hell-spawn city of another universe was living, that its unfamiliar life was single yet multiple, that its lurid eyes looked now through the door. Out from the insane living metropolis glided pseudopods of its green substance, glided toward the door. Innes saw that in the end of each pseudopod was one of the lurid eyes. He saw those eyed pseudopods come questing through the door, onto the dais. The yellow eyes of light seemed fixed on the row of stiff victims, and the pseudopods glided toward them. Through the open door was beating wave on wave of unfamiliar, tingling forces that Innes felt even through the protective robe. The hooded multitude bent in awe as the green pseudopods glided toward the victims faster, with avid eagerness. Innes saw them reaching for the prisoners, for Ruth, and he made a tremendous mental effort to break the spell that froze him. In that moment pistol shots crashed across the cavern, and a stream of bullets smashed the pulsing web of wires. The door began instantly to close. Darkness crept back around the edges of the mighty oval. As though alarmed, the lurid-eyed pseudopods of the Hell City recoiled from the victims, back through the dwindling door. And as the door dwindled, the light in the cavern was failing. Ruth! yelled Ennis madly, and sprang forward and grasped her, his pistol leaping into his other hand. Ennis, quick! shouted Campbell's voice across the cavern. The door dwindled away altogether. The great oval facet was completely black. The light was fast dying, too. The chief priest sprang madly toward Ennis, and as he did so, the hooded hordes of the Brotherhood recovered from their paralysis of horror and surged madly toward the dais. "'The door is closed! Death to the blasphemers!' cried the chief priest as he plunged forward. "'Death to the blasphemers!' shrieked the crazed horde below. Innes' pistol roared, and the chief priest went down. The light in the cavern died completely at that moment. In the dark a torrent of bodies catapulted against Innes, screaming vengeance. He struck out with his pistol barrel at the mad melee, holding Ruth's stiff form close with his other hand. He heard the other drugged, helpless victims, crushed down and trampled underfoot by the surging horde of vengeance-mad members. Clinging to the girl, Innes fought like a madman through the darkness, in which none could distinguish friend or foe, toward the door at the side from which Campbell had fired. He smashed down the pistol barrel on all before him, as the hand sought to grab him in the dark. He knew sickeningly that he was lost in the combat, with no sense of direction of the door. Then a voice roared aloud across the wild din. Innes, this way! This way, Innes! yelled Inspector Campbell again and again. Innes plunged through the whirl of unseen bodies in the direction of the detective's shouting voice. He smashed through, half dragging and half carrying the girl until Campbell's voice was close ahead in the dark. He fumbled with the rock wall, found the door opening, and then Campbell's hands grasped him and pulled him inside. Hands grasped him from behind, striving to tear Ruth from him, to jerk him back. Voices shrieked for help. Campbell's pistol blazed in the dark. Inna stumbled with the girl through the door into a dark tunnel. He heard Campbell slam the door shut, and heard a bar fall with a clang. "'Quick, for God's sake!' panted Campbell in the dark. "'They'll follow us. We've got to get up through the tunnels to the water cavern.' 
They raced along the pitch-dark tunnel, Campbell now carrying the girl, Innes reeling drunkenly along. They heard a mounting roar behind them, and as they burst into the main tunnel, no longer lighted, but dark like the others, they looked back and saw a flicker of light coming up the passage. They're after us, and they've got lights, Campbell cried. Hurry! It was nightmare. It was mad flight on stumbling feet up through the dark tunnels where they could hear the sea booming close overhead and could hear the wild pursuit behind. Their feet slipped on the damp floor and they crashed into the walls of the tunnel at the turns. The pursuit was close behind. As they started climbing the last passages into the water cavern, the torchlight behind showed them to their pursuers and wild yells came to their ears. They had before them only the last ascent to the water cavern, when Innes stumbled and went down. He swayed up a little and yelled to Campbell, Go on, get Ruth out. I'll try to hold them back a moment. No, Campbell rasped. There's another way, one that may mean the end of us too, but our only chance. The inspector thrust his hands into his pockets and snatched out the old-fashioned gold watch. He tore it from its chain turned the stem of it twice around. Then he hurled it back down the tunnel with all his force. Quick, out of the tunnel now, or we'll die right here, he yelled. They lunged forward, Campbell dragging both the girl and the exhausted Innes, and emerged a moment later in the great water cavern. It was now lit only by the searchlight of their waiting cutter. As they emerged into the cavern, they were thrown flat on the rock ledge by a violent movement of it under them. An awful detonation and thunderous crash of falling rock smote their ears. Following the first tremendous crash, giant rumbling of collapsing rock shook the water cavern. To the cutter, Campbell cried. That watch of mine was filled with the most concentrated high explosive known, and it's blown up the tunnels. Now it's touched off more collapses, and all those caverns and passages will fall in on us any moment. The awful rumbling and crashing of collapsing rock masses was deafening to their ears as they lurched toward the cutter. Great chunks of rock were falling from the cavern roof into the water. Stuart, white-faced, but asking no questions, had the motor of the cutter running, and helped them pull the unconscious girl aboard. Out of the tunnel at once! Campbell ordered, full speed. They roared down the water tunnel at crazy velocity, the searchlight beam stabbing ahead. The tide had reached flood and turned, increasing the speed with which they dashed through the tunnel. Masses of rock fell with loud splashes behind them, and all around them was still the ominous grinding of mighty weights of rock. The walls of the tunnel quivered repeatedly. Stuart suddenly reversed the propellers, but in spite of his action, the cutter smashed a moment later into a solid rock wall. It was a mass of rock forming an unbroken barrier across the water tunnel, extending beneath the surface of the water. We're trapped, cried Stuart. A mass of the rock has settled here and blocked the tunnel. It can't be completely blocked, Campbell exclaimed. See, the tide still runs out beneath it. Our one chance is to swim out under the blocking mass of rock before the whole cliff gives way. But there's no telling how far the block may extend, Stuart cried. Then, as Campbell and Innes stripped off their coats and shoes, he followed their example. The rumble of grinding rock around them was now continuous and nerve-shattering. Campbell helped Innes lower Ruth's unconscious form into the water. Keep your hand over her nose and mouth, cried the inspector. Come on, now. Stuart went first, his face pale in the searchlight beam as he dived under the rock mass. The tidal current carried him out of sight in a moment. Then, holding the girl between them, and with Innes' hand covering her mouth and nostrils, the other two dived. Down through the cold waters they shot, and then the swift current was carrying them forward like a mill race, their bodies bumping and scraping against the rock mass overhead. Innes' lungs began to burn, his brain to reel, as they rushed on in the water, still holding the girl tightly. They struck solid rock, a wall across their way. The current sucked them downward into a small opening at the bottom. They wedged in it, struggling fiercely, 
then tore through it. They rose on the other side of it, into pure air. They were in the darkness, floating in the tunnel beyond the block, the current carrying them swiftly outward. The walls were shaking and roaring frightfully about them as they were borne around the turns of the tunnel. Then they saw ahead of them a circle of dim light, pricked with white stars. The current bore them out into the starlight, into the open sea. Before them in the water floated Stuart, and they swam with him out from the shaking, grinding cliffs. The girl stirred a little in Innes' grasp, and he saw in the starlight that her face was no longer dazed. Paul, she muttered, clinging close to Innes in the water. She's coming back to consciousness. The water must have revived her from that drug, he cried. Then he was cut short by Campbell's cry. Look! Look! cried the inspector, pointing back at the black cliffs. In the starlight the whole cliff was collapsing with a prolonged, terrible roar, as of grinding planets, its face breaking and buckling. The waters around them boiled furiously, whirling them this way and that. Then the waters quieted. They found they had been flung near a sandy spit beyond the shattered cliffs, and they swam toward it. The whole underground honeycomb of caverns and tunnels gave way, and the sea poured in, Campbell cried. The door and the brotherhood of the door are ended forever. End of The Door into Infinity by Edward Hamilton Double Standard by Alfred Koppel this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Double Standard by Alfred Koppel. He did not have the qualifications to go into space, so he had them manufactured. It was after 0100 when Kane arrived at my apartment. I checked the hall screen carefully before letting him in, too, though the hour almost precluded the possibility of any inquisitive passers-by. He didn't say anything at all when he saw me, but his eyes went a bit wide. That was perfectly natural, after all. The illegal plasti cosmetician had done his work better than well. I wasn't the same person I had been. I led Kane into the living room and stood before him letting him have a good look at me well i asked will it work kane lit a cigarette thoughtfully not taking his eyes off me maybe he said just maybe i thought about the spaceship standing proud and tall under the stars ready to go and i knew that it had to work it had to some men dream of money others of power all my life i had dreamed only of lands in the sky, the red sand hills of Mars moldering in aged slumber under cobalt colored day, the icy moraines of Io and Callisto, where the yellow methane snow drifted in the faint light of the sun, the barren stark seas of the moon, where razor backed mountains limbed themselves against the star fields. I don't know, Kim. You're asking a hell of a lot, you know, Kane said. It'll work, I assured him. The examination is cursory after the application has been acted on. I grinned easily under the flesh mask, and mine was. You mean Kim Hall's application has, he said. I shrugged. Well? Kane frowned at me and blew smoke into the still air of the room. The Kim Hall on the application and you aren't exactly the same person i don't have to tell you that look i said i called you here tonight to check me over and because we've been friends for a good long time this is important to me kane it isn't just that i want to go i have to you can understand that maybe yes ken he said bitterly i can understand maybe if i had your build and mass I'd be trying the same thing right now. My only chance was the eugenics board, and they turned me down cold. Remember? Sex-linked predilection to carcinoma. Unsuitable for colonial breeding stock. 
i felt a wave of pity for kane then i was almost sorry i'd called him over within six hours i would be on board the spaceship while he would be here earthbound for always unsuitable for breeding stock in the controlled colonies of mars or io or callisto i thought about that too i knew i wouldn't be able to carry off my masquerade forever i wouldn't want to the stringent physical examination given on landing would pierce my disguise easily but by that time it would be too late i'd be there out among the stars and no earthbound spaceship captain would carry my mass back instead of precious cargo i'd stay if they wanted me for a breeder then okay in spite of my slight build and lack of physical strength i'd still be where i wanted to be in the fey lands in the sky i wish you all the luck in the world kim my friend said i really do i don't mean to throw cold water on your scheme you know how few of us are permitted off world every one who makes it is a he grinned ruefully a blow struck for equality he savored the irony of it for a moment and then his face grew serious again it's just that the more i think of what you've done the more convinced i am that you can't get away with it forged applications fake fingerprints and x-rays and this he made a gesture that took in all of my appearance flesh hair clothes everything what the hell i said it's good isn't it very good in fact you make me uncomfortable it's so good but it's too damn insane insane enough to work i said and it's the only chance how do you think i'd stack up with the eugenics board not a chance what they want out there is big muscle boys tough breeders this is the only way for me well kane said you're big enough now it seems to me had to be lots to cover up lots to add and you're all set packed and ready yes i said all set then i guess this is it he extended his hand i took it good luck kim always he said huskily i'll hear if you make it all of us will and we'll be cheering and thinking that maybe before we're all too old we can make it too and if not that maybe our sons will without having to be prize bulls either he turned in the doorway and forced a grin don't forget to write he said the space field was streaked with the glare of floodlights and the ship gleamed like a silvery spire against the desert night i joined the line of passengers at the checking desk my half kilo of baggage clutched nervously against my side my heart was pounding with a mixture of fear and anticipation my muscles twitching under the unaccustomed tension of the plastiflesh sheet that hid me all around me were the smells and sounds and sights of a spaceport and above me were the stars brilliant and close at hand in the dark sky the queue moved swiftly toward the checking desk where a gray-haired officer with a seamed face sat the voice of the timekeeper came periodically from the loudspeakers around the perimeter of the field passengers for the martian queen check in at desk five it is now h minus forty seven i stood now before the officer tense and afraid this was critical the last checkpoint before i could actually set foot in the ship it is now h minus forty five the timer's metallic voice said the officer looked up at me and then at the faked photoprint on my papers kim hall age twenty nine vocation agri technician and hydroponics expert height one hundred and seventy one centimeters weight eighty kilos right i nodded soundlessly sums check within mass limits physical condition index three point sixty nine fertility index three point sixty six compatibility index two point ninety nine the officer turned to a trim-looking assistant all check the uniformed girl nodded 
i began to breathe again next desk please the officer said shortly i moved on to the medics at the next stop a gray-clad nurse checked my pulse and respiration she smiled at me excited she asked don't be she indicated the section of the checking station where the breeders were being processed you should see how the bulls take it she said with a laugh she picked up an electrified stamp now don't worry this won't hurt and it won't disfigure you permanently but the ship's guards won't let you aboard without it government regulations you know we cannot load personal dossiers on the ships and this will tell the officers all they need to know about you weight limitations you see i almost laughed in her face at that if there was one thing all earth could offer me that i wanted it was that stamp on my forehead a passport to the stars she set the stamp and pressed it against my forehead i had a momentary fear about the durability of the flesh mask that covered my face but it was unnecessary the plastic skin took the temporary tattoo the way real flesh would have i felt the skin and read it in my mind i knew exactly what it said i dreamed of it so often and so long all my life my ticket on the martian queen my pass to those lands in the sky cert s x f hall k r s mark queen s n one seven seven five six nine zero i walked across the ramp and into the lift beside the great tapering hull of the rocket my heart was singing the timer said it is h minus thirty one and then i stepped through the outer valve into the queen the air was brisk with the tang of hydrogenol space fuel the ship was alive and humming with a thousand relays and timers and whispering generators readying herself for space i lay down in the acceleration hammock and listened to the ship this was everything i had wished for all my life to be a free man among the stars it was worth the chances i had taken worth the lying and cheating and danger the conquest of space had split humanity in a manner that no one could have foreseen though the reasons for the schism were obvious they hinged on two factors mass and durability thus it was that some remained forever earthbound while others reached for the sky and bureaucracy being what it was the decision as to who stayed and who went was made along the easy obvious line of demarcation i and half the human race were on the wrong side of the line from the ship's speakers came the voice of the timer it is h minus ten ready yourselves for the take-off i thought of king and the men i had known and worked with for half of my twenty-nine years they too were forbidden the sky tragic men really with their need and their dream written in the lines of pain and yearning on their faces the speaker suddenly snapped there is an illegal passenger on board all persons will remain in their quarters until he is apprehended repeat there is an illegal passenger on board remain in your quarters my heart seemed to stop beating somehow my deception had been uncovered how it didn't matter but it had and the important thing now was simply to stay on board at all costs a spaceship departure could not be delayed the orbit was computed the blastaway time to the millisecond i looked to the deck and out of my cubicle a spidery catwalk led upward toward the nose of the ship before me i could hear the first sounds of the search i ran up the walk my footsteps sounding hollowly in the steel shaft a bulkhead blocked my progress ahead and i saw the next step the timer said it is h minus six it was a passenger deck i could see frightened faces peering out of the cubicles as i ran past behind me the pursuit grew louder nearer i slammed open a bulkhead and found another walk leading upward toward the astrogation blisters in the topmost point of the queen behind me 
i caught a glimpse of a ship's officer running armed with a stun pistol my breath rasped in my throat and the plastic skin sheath on my body shifted sickeningly you there halt the voice was high-pitched and excited i flung through another bulkhead hatch and out into the dorsal blister i seemed to be suspended between earth and sky the stars glittered through the steel glass of the blister and the desert lay below streaked with searchlights and covered with tiny milling figures the warning light on the control bunker turned from amber to red as i watched chest even it is h minus three the timer said rigged ship for space i slammed the hatch shut and spun the wheel lock i stood filled with a mixture of triumph and fear they could never get me out of the ship in time now but i would have to face blast away in the bluster unprotected a shock that could kill through the speaker the captain's talkers snapped orders abandon pursuit too late to dump him now pick him up after acceleration is completed and then maliciously knowing that i could hear scrape him off the deck when we're in space that kind can't take much i felt a blaze of red fury that kind the earthbound kind i wanted to live then more than i had ever wanted to live before to make a liar out of that sneering superior voice to prove that i was as good as all of them it is h minus one said the timer orders filtered through the speaker outer valves closed inner valves closed minus thirty seconds condition red pressure in the ship one-third atmosphere twenty seconds ship secure for space ten nine eight i lay prone on the steel deck braced myself and prayed seven six five gyros on course set four three two the ship trembled a great light flared beyond the curving transparency of the blister up ship a hand smashed down on me crushing me into the deck i thought i must live i can't die i won't die i felt the spaceship rising i felt her reaching for the stars i was a part of her i screamed with pain and exultation the hand pressed harder choking the breath from me stripping the plastic skin away in long damp strips darkness flickered before my eyes i lay helpless and afraid and transfigured with a joy i had never known before distorted half naked i clung to light when i opened my eyes they were all around me they stood in a half circle trim uniformed their smooth faces and cropped hair and softly moulded bodies looked strange against the functional steel angularity of the astrogation blister i staggered to my feet long strips of plastic flesh dangling from me the queen was in space i was in space no longer earthbound yes i said i lived look at me i stripped off the flesh mask peeled away the red full lips the long transformation i've done it others will do it too not breeders not brainless ornaments to a hyper nymphoid phallus just ordinary men ordinary men with a dream you can't keep the sky for yourselves it belongs to all of us i stood with my back to the blazing stars and laughed at them in the beginning it was right that you should be given priority over us for centuries we kept you in subjection and when the age of space came you found your place your stamina your small stature everything about you fitted you to be mistresses of the sky but it's over over and done with we can all be free i peeled away the artificial breasts that dangled from my chest i stood swaying drunkenly defiantly they came to me then they took me gently and carried me below to the comfort of a white bunk they soothed my hurts and nursed me for in spite of it all they were women and i was a man in pain End of double standard by alfred cobble